you know, the reason they, they like reading my stuff is that I've always got real life examples to prove what I'm saying. There's a lot of good people that listen to this podcast. You know, other than God and my family, deer hunting would be next in line on my list of priorities. From the bottom of our hearts, it's it's just fantastic and awesome to uh, to have the support that you guys are getting. People ask me about expandable broadheads and love swings. <laughs> Chasing Giants with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. Brought to you by Osseo Camo, nature's most lethal camouflage. Follow along as Don and Terry discuss the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Well, welcome everyone to the Chasing Giants podcast brought to you by Osseo Gear with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. We're on episode 132 at the end of August. Uh, we're getting close to the Kentucky season. I got one week before I'm going to be sitting in a tree stand. Don, you are back home. But most of all, I'm I'm looking at this Chasing Giants hard hat and... Uh, uh, I don't think it's for uh, recovering from the China virus. What's going on with that thing? Well, this hard hat was sent to me by one of our listeners and good friend, uh, Todd Kobe there. And he's your neighbor, isn't he? Yeah, he lives down the road from me. We both got us one, so. Yeah, well, Todd has a, a company where he dips various items for people. And he uh, made some Chasing Giants hard hats for you and I. And. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to wear it this week on the podcast. Well, Todd's a good friend. Uh, you did a consulting visit on his property. Um, I stopped by and, and talked to him today. I was out there. He's implementing the plan uh, as close as I think possible. And I think like Wes just said, um, Wes is going to be on a, a segment that we just recorded a little bit ago. There's short term uh, um, kind of uh, tangible things that we see from a plan uh, from a consulting visit. And there's long term. He's already seeing more deer uh, just from some of the strategies that you put in place. But uh, Todd's a great guy. We appreciate the support of not only him, but all of our other listeners. Uh, we got a lot of really special people that support us and um, can't thank everyone enough. But uh, yeah, Don's going to keep his hard hat on. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to keep mine. I'm going to take mine off. Uh, so, um, uh, let's, let's circle back real quick and, uh, talk a little bit about what you got going on this week. I, I assume you're feeling better. You sound a whole lot better than you did last week. Yeah, I'm about close to a hundred percent. I don't know if I'm a hundred percent yet, but I'm right there. And, uh, I felt good enough yesterday. I did, I planted plots all day. And uh, then yesterday evening, I put up a new flagpole at my house with my daughter and son-in-law. So uh, I had a full day of working basically daylight till dark. Um, so, yeah, so I'm back at it. I got my plots in. It's thundering and lightning right now. So I may get rain on them new, them freshly planted plots or hoping yeah. so anyway. Yeah, we're going to talk about fall plots a little bit. I did the same thing of mine. Uh, did you get any cameras checked this week? I did. I, I checked probably half a dozen or so. Um, no big surprises on any of them. Um, well, we're going to uh, we're going to have a little bit of a special uh, section on here in just a few weeks. You're going to be giving your buck forecast. So uh, all these trail camera checks are going to be leading up to that. But this year you decided before you do the final buck forecast of the of the fall or, or late summer, uh, you're also going to survey the Dream Team, which we announced last week that you've brought on some additional consultants. And Wes Delks is going to join us here in just a little bit. We have already recorded that segment, and I'll, I'll put it in here, but uh, stay tuned for that. Um, as far as your uh, fall plots, were they in areas that you had already kind of made your mind up that they were just going to be in fall? Or did you have the creek get out of the bank and, and ruin some more uh, in this in this spring's uh, storms? I know you've had that happen several times over the last few years. Yeah, no, this year, uh, all my fall plots were where I had planned them since spring. Um, one of those I had planted in uh, the soil charge, new soil charge mix uh, Real World's got. 
Um, you know, others, I just kept the weeds down all summer and, and waited for the time to be right. I know uh, one thing I'll throw out there is I've been seeing on social media these people that have been planting plots for the last month, it seems like. And um, I'll just repeat, I've said it before in recent episodes, but people get in way too big a hurry in the fall. And I, I typically wait until uh, um, Labor Day weekend to plant mine, but we had this rain coming in and that supposed to rain tonight and tomorrow. And then after that, it's supposed to be dry for the, for 10 days in the forecast. So I wanted to hit that rain is the only reason I planned them about a week earlier than I normally would. So yep. if you haven't planted yet, you're, you're not missing the boat. Right. You still got plenty of time. Uh, we announced last week that real world has the new pilot program of the Southern fall blend and the people in the South have a whole lot more time that, that product down <laughs> South in you know, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, the Carolinas, Tennessee, um, you know, that product can be well into October. So you have plenty of time. And matter of fact, the later that you plant it, the better it is. We don't need, we need the palatability and the traction of the small plants. We don't need these huge giant uh, bulbs in, in early September. So I was, I did fall plots uh, yesterday also. Um, you know, a long time ago, you challenged me on not only diversity, but the layout of a, of a plot and, you know, going more long, narrow. Um, and and it, I know it's hard on some properties to really accomplish what you want. But one of the things that we talked about years ago was using height variations where a deer will use either an edge of miscanthus or say an edge of corn to beans or beans to clover or alfalfa. So, um you know, I had a really, really, I, I did a lot of corn this year because we were doing a lot of testing at Real World for corn. So I think there is either three or four, vari four varieties of corn on my property this year. So I had way too much corn knowing that a lot of it was test. And one of the things I did this year um, that I've been really uh, successful with is called a runway. So when you can identify where that bedding is and where the deer come out, We've done a lot of things to funnel the deer specific in a specific area out, but going in, I took, um, I took the disc cars and bush hog in and, and mowed down, uh, basically a runway strategically through the corn. And that's all been planted in deadly dozen this year. So, um, using the corn standing corn through the winter, I think, uh, I've, I've had really good luck with it in the past funneling those deer up to where they'll be within bow range. So. I was thinking while I was doing that, there's there's three big things, and, and you can add to the list or comment on any of them, that I think people make mistakes with with planting food plots. And the first one is they plant too early or they plant uh, when there's just going to be a little bit of moisture and then it turns hot. Uh, those seeds will swell, crack, and without moisture, they'll, they'll just die and not make it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, the situation I just described with our weather forecast, uh, supposed to get rain tomorrow and then be dry for 10 days, but we've had we've had moisture all summer, so we're, we're not stressed for, yeah. for moisture, and I, I used the Genesis drill and put that seed in the ground without breaking the soil, so I conserved a lot of soil moisture that way. I, I, the seed's not laying on the surface, it's not actually you know, plant it in the ground, but I didn't right. have to break the ground to do it. And then that's what I love about that Genesis drill. So uh, I, I'm sitting in perfect shape. If I could just get a half inch of rain to kind of seal that ground where that drill went in and, and add a little bit of moisture, I, I'll have green popping up by this time next week when we do the next podcast. The other thing I was thinking about when I was when I was planning this week is, you know, there's and this isn't specific to real world. This is anybody that's looking at a product that uh, has a, a different varieties of seeds in it with different shapes and sizes. And I think what we do is is we don't realize that even at real world, when we bag the it's this year's seed that was harvested harvested last fall those seeds in that bag will settle. So like you have a blend like Deadly Dozen that has cereal grains, winter peas, and then the brassicas, which are basically little bitty, little bitty, uh, they look like the tip of a pin. Those, those seeds will settle to the bottom of the bag. And what I've seen people do is not shake that up or stir it. They'll pour it into their, uh, you know, broadcast spreader and then just start walking across the field without mixing it thoroughly. 
And what you end up with is with hot spots of those brassicas in there because they've all sunk to the bottom of the bag. Right. Yeah, you definitely need to stir up those blends um, to get a good mix. All right, well, we're going to cut our conversation short a little bit. And after we hear from our folks at Osseo, we're going to switch over and get buck, uh, buck forecast information from a Dream Team member, Wes Delks, also known as The Prodigy. Uh, this segment uh, we're going to do over the next, uh, this week and the next two before Don makes his buck forecast for the year. And basically just another data point from your consultant teams about what they're seeing on properties they're running. So let's listen to a spot from Osseo and then we'll bring West Ducks on. Osseo Gear introduces a premium line of bow hunting gear that is unmatched. Pairing nature's finest camouflage with the best technological innovations, Osseo Gear brings whitetail bow hunters the gear they need to be the best at their craft. The unique camouflage mimics the intricate feather pattern of North America's greatest predatorial creatures. Designed for invisibility, built for comfort, and engineered for function. Visit osseogear.com. That's A-S-I-O gear.com to start shopping. Osseo Gear, prepare to be invisible. Well, welcome to the Buck Forecast section of the podcast tonight. Uh, as we just spoke a little bit ago, we have Wes Delks, who is a.k.a. the Prodigy, with us. And, uh, you know, this section of podcast for the next three weeks, Don has decided to use his uh, consulting team that he called the Dream Team to tee up because we're all from different sections uh, around the country. So uh, our first installment of a buck forecast or observation in the field is going to call come from west and indiana but uh i'm gonna let there's a lot of new listeners to this podcast that don't know wes and uh i want i want to first because i know wes is going to be a little humble talking about himself don i want you to talk about this young man that came to you as a business partner a few years ago and what you've seen him develop into as he's put his heart and soul into into this industry well, actually, I met Wes several years before that. Um, his mother-in-law and I are, are actually cousins. And uh, so his mother-in-law contacted me and said her new son-in-law is just crazy about deer hunting and he wanted to meet me and she wanted to know if that'd be okay. So one year around Christmas time, uh, I had lunch with Wes and his wife, Madison, and his in-laws and um, got to know him and then he, he came to my house several times, you know, over the next couple of years. Um, he came actually when I shot uh, Smokey and Trump. He showed up at my house then, but he'd been there before that. And, uh, you know, basically he was just trying to to learn from me the, the ropes of killing big deer. And, you know, the thing that really struck me about Wes from the get-go was that he didn't try to impress me with his big buck stories. and you know, like a, a lot of young guys, they've got so many stories about giant bucks that, uh, you know, they can't quit talking. But whenever Wes would talk, he was always asking questions. He wasn't trying to impress me with his knowledge. He was trying to pick my brain and learn more. And then, uh, you know, he showed up at my house and helped with different projects uh, over the years. And then um, he had a chance to buy into real world, I think, four years ago. So, uh you know, him and his wife, Madison, bought into Real World and they moved to Illinois. And, and that's just been an absolute blessing. Uh, him and I spent the first year basically getting the wheels back on the bus. But after that, it's been just going like gangbusters. And, um, you know, I, I think the thing that the reason for our success, but also the reason I have so much respect for for Wes is because of uh, his, his outlook on life spiritually. Um you know, he's a Christian, doesn't ever hide it. Um, he, he could be sitting at a table with 10 guys that are all old enough to be his dad, and he doesn't mind being the one to ask the blessing. Um, you know, he's always asking blessings for other people. Um, a very giving person, um, him and his wife both, you know, just very generous with their time and their energy uh, to help others. 
And, uh, you know, he's just been a fantastic partner at Real World. And then a couple of years ago, um, my consulting business had grown to the point where I just couldn't handle all, all the, uh, the calls I was getting. And um, Wes had also worked on a lease with me. Him and I had a lease together. And um, by this point, I was really comfortable with him. And uh, so he started doing some consulting under me and um, it, that's just exploded. In fact, the last two years, each year, he's done more consulting visits than I have. And uh, I'm 100% fine with that, believe me. But, uh, you know, uh, he's just a young man with a bright future. And, and uh, the big reason for it is that he's got his priorities in order. You know, hunting isn't first, uh, his faith is, and, and then his family and he recently moved back to Indiana, but that doesn't mean we're still not going to be working together. Um, but you know, when he, he's just a natural for this buck forecast because he, he's got a firm handle on things. He's, he, he's taken pages out of my book and he's just followed them to a, a, to the letter on his new Indiana farm. And one of those things is you branch out from your property with your trail cameras to get a good handle on where your bucks that are there in the fall, where do they spend their summers? And, uh, you know, he's, he's running trail cameras in multiple States and, uh, you know, he's got a, whatever he says, I trust uh, right. put it that way. So well, I, think, well, I John, think I appreciate the kind words, but it is really hard for me to take you seriously with that hat on. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things before Wes talks that I want to tee off of what uh, Don just said is he's taken, uh, things out of your book and unfortunately, uh, not to get Don fired up on a rant, but more show the credibility of Wes. Wes is, w w you call Wes the prodigy, and he is, he has really tried to dive in and learn every aspect. But there's also a lot of people that take every page out of their book and get on social media and show, oh, look what I'm doing. Look what I'm doing. And we've given these guys free attendance to the master class. We've, <laughs> we've let them be real world dealers or pro staff, and then they try to be competitors. Um, you know, Wes is very little about himself and more about giving and helping others. And I think that's, what's going to make him a great consultant and a, a, a great, um, career in this industry. I think we need more of that. So to dive into the nuts and bolts here, uh, Wes, I want to first, um, you know, there's a lot of new listeners that don't know you. What's it like to have the Mike Trout, you know, Mike Trout's probably the best baseball player in, in the business right now. What's it like to have Mike Trout of the hunting industry, Don Higgins, talk about you as a young man and, and hunter and consultant like Don just did? I'm just curious. It's humbling. It's very humbling. Yeah. Um, I tell people all the time that I got my education at Purdue University in wildlife management, but more than that education, I value my education at Higgins University. <laughs> and that is such a rare, uh, I don't even want to use the word opportunity, but blessing to learn as closely, to be on properties with Don and I mean, hunting his farm and shooting the bucks that I have on, on his own farm and go around with him to various consulting uh, clients and have that experiences with him. It, it's just pretty special. I remember um, when you were hunting for Mel and we were on the west side of your farm. And I took that picture and posted on social media We were when we were in that big oak tree. And it's just kind of a surreal moment is I'm sitting with Don chasing a 220 inch deer. Like this is this is pretty unbelievable from what I would have thought. I mean, just an Indiana kid growing up, happy to see a, a Pope and young deer. Yeah, I know that feeling the day that we videoed him as the year before and sitting there in a world-class buck at 216 is in front of you and, yeah. and you're not even going to shoot him. So, uh, yeah. but let's, let's cut to the chase here. Uh, you know, uh, you've shifted a little bit. You've moved back to the state of, of Indiana and purchased a farm with your lovely wife, Madison, to create Higgins 2.0. Uh, that's what you've kind of nicknamed it, if I'm not mistaken, but, uh, you, you sought out this property. I want to talk about your property a little bit first and some of the projects going on there. You sought out this property that wasn't even for sale just by research and observations of what would make a, a world-class, uh, deer hunting property in the future. 
Uh, talk a little bit about, you don't have to go into the details of the acreage and everything, but what, when you saw this property, not even having it on the market, caught your eye that said, this could be something special. Yep. Um, so for me, the first thing was location. Um, Don talked about my priorities being my faith and my family. So family, um, my parents and my in-laws live a half mile apart. So we wanted to be pretty close to family. So I had a a certain county area that I wanted to be in. And I started looking at on X and plat maps and aerial maps of uh, property layouts. And I compiled a list of 30 properties, actually probably more than that, 30 to 40 properties in the county area that I wanted to be in that laid out a certain way. What that layout was is I wanted to limit the amount of border where there was potential neighboring hunting pressure. So I, I wanted to be in a bunch of ag. If anybody's been to the master class, um, my home county here where I grew up, there's it's 90% ag, which is very similar to Don's County. Um, it's a sea of agriculture. And if you can get that um, isolated cover within that sea of ag, you're limiting the neighboring hunting pressure and if you have permission to walk through the ag with the wind blowing out, um, then access is about bulletproof. So access and limiting neighboring hunting pressure, those were the two things I looked for. And then I just started knocking on those doors. Um, one at a time, checking them off the list, got a lot of no's, made multiple trips back uh, to this state to get those to, to talk with people and it was a lot of no's a lot of heartbreak and then uh eventually um this particular property was owned by two sisters that were out of state and i didn't have the opportunity to talk to them i wrote them a letter and um one thing kind of led to the next so um let's dissect a little bit we know that uh the property has its isolation so you know it's kind of out in the middle uh, with with good access. So let's talk about the thought process of taking over what was some priorities you did. You know, this is kind of the same strategy you would do with a consulting client. It's you identify your goals of what you want to do in a county like where you're in in Indiana. It's not known to have big deer if you know because of of multiple reasons, but um, it has great potential. So what was some goals that you identified both short term and long term? And then what was the first projects that you kind of checked off the list? And have you seen any uh, tangible results from those first things that you did on the list? Uh, let's let's just kind of walk through it like that real quick. Um, well, the first thing on the farm, there's really three things that stick uh, out to me. But the first thing on the farm is I simply needed to increase the amount of cover. I'm in a low cover area being so much agriculture. So this year we added about seven, eight acres of tree planting and 17 acres of switchgrass that was previously an ag. So I've got 25 plus acres of cover that was not previously here. That's gonna help. Um, so making the cover thicker by planting trees, switchgrass, and then the timber cover that I had, we made that thicker, thicker by logging. So I've improved the quality of my cover in both the timber and the places that I planted, obviously. It will take a little time for sunlight to do its thing and for those plantings to get thicker, but improving the cover and then large, diverse food sources. And then lastly, but not least, and this was the one that I did see tangible results, is just staying the heck out. <laughs> and it was amazing to me. Um, we closed on this property in October and just staying out. I, I didn't hunt this property a single time last year. And by January last year, post season, I was running a feeder and I probably had 25 to 30 deer here that were feeding out of that feeder, which is guaranteed more than they were ever on this farm before. Was uh, that, was that property hunted before you bought it? Did yeah, someone actually. It? Uh, the local conservation officer and a fireman hunted it. So I had to kick off the conservation <laughs> officer. And uh, actually, um, I won't say his name for privacy reasons, but um, my wife and I, Madison, we invited the conservation officer and his family over to our house for dinner. 
Uh, they came over a couple weeks ago, and he is a heck of a guy. Um, I'm really happy to have him as a friend and somebody that's close by that can help me out. Um, I think it would be good knowing him. Well, I want to ask Don a quick question about a comment that Wes just made there about just a, a short-term tangible result of keeping intrusion down. He said he closed in October, so no one hunted it last year, but he already started seeing more deer there. So we know that that works as far as just deer feeling secure where they're not constantly being bumped. But long term, what is that doing for, you know, your articles that you've written for homecoming bucks and all that different things, those fawns that are born there right now? Uh, I think I think we take for granted a little bit that they remember those kind of areas as a safe zone and a lot of extra food that they never had. So if, if they're looking to come back from their range wherever they move, I think that's a I think that's a thing that we overlook a lot. Well, and with each succeeding generation of deer, the safety of that sanctuary just becomes more ingrained in them. And, you know, uh, Wes is young enough that the day's coming when the, he's going to have a hard time pushing the deer off of his place because they relate to it so well as the safest place in the neighborhood that a little bit of human intrusion don't bother him. But you got to build up to that. And that's what, one of the things that frustrates me with um, some of the stuff you see on social media, but also sometimes with clients, they just, they just can't accept it. But you got to start with a really hard line stance on no human intrusion. If you can go for about 10 years and just absolutely stay out, you've built several generations of deer that have that ingrained in them. And then you can start getting away with a little bit of human intrusion. It's like a state park, you know, where the deer are just almost tame. Well, there's people there and there's people having picnics and doing whatever, walking trails. But it, it's so ingrained in those deer that that's the safe place. And then they're willing to put up with some human intrusion. Right. But the key thing is you got to build up to that point. And I, and I think it takes about 10 years to, to really get a, a property cranking. Well, Wes, I know everything hasn't gone perfect either with your ventures with the farm. I saw that the loggers, uh, you know, destroyed some of your corn. I saw on your social media that you had to go back in and put some fall plots in because of, of them being in there. But that wasn't necessarily a bad thing either. No, actually, uh, the way they took out the corn and um, it, it, I'll get to have some greens in between cover and, and grain that I'll leave standing. So, yeah, it should work out. All right. Well, real good. Hey, real quick, before we take a break, can both of you all close out of your Explorer where your emails are coming in? Because that's chiming in. Yep. All right. Well, uh, you're going through a transition right now. When you moved back to Indiana, you went from a year hunting Illinois and Kansas, I believe, last year and Kentucky to this year, I think you're focusing more on properties and permission properties in Indiana and Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken, Wes. So what have you been seeing as a comparison? And, uh, you know, we're building up to Don's buck forecast here in a couple of weeks. So what's your observation so far? Yeah, um, I think that my buck forecast might be a little unique compared to the other guys, just because like, for example, Don, when he gives his buck forecast, He's making that forecast based on decades of data in Illinois. Um, last year, I just had cameras in Illinois and Kansas. And this year, I've got cameras in Indiana and Kentucky. So I don't have the a good comparison of... Yeah, there's no previous data point. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you... Um, before I get my buck forecast, if you will, is I, I want to make a, a comment that Don said to me. Uh, we were driving around Southwest Iowa when he was looking uh, for properties in Southwest Iowa, and he just made the comment to me that if you want to kill a booner, you have to hunt where a booner is at. And he makes so many comments that just are so simple and uh, commonsensical, <laughs> but makes total sense. And I made a list of all the big deer that I had on camera this year and sent text you guys that picture of what I had gotten in uh, Kentucky and Indiana. And what it showed 
was in Indiana. Um, I've got cameras on 15 properties. And in Kentucky, I've got cameras on seven properties. Um, in Indiana, two of those properties are public. I'm running about 30 cameras and I've got nine deer out of, out of 22 properties. I've got nine deer that are over 140. Um, and that's in Indiana and Kentucky. Last year in Illinois, in Kansas, I had almost 30 deer. So triple the amount of good bucks, 140 pluses uh, on roughly the same amount of properties and the same cameras. So that just goes to show you right there. I mean, um, like all places are not created equal. If you want to kill a good deer, you got to be where one is at. But I do have one good one to chase that I'm really excited about uh, in Indiana. Um, I've got one out of the properties in Indiana and Kentucky. I've got one Boone and Crockett buck to chase. And uh, you could spend a lot of time on 21 other properties and never kill a Boone and Crockett deer. <laughs> Uh, but there's one where there is a Boone and Crockett deer and I'm looking forward to chasing. Well, I think, uh, this goes back to finding your kind of a uh, place in your journey of, of what you want to do as a whitetail hunter and setting goals and sticking to them because, you know, uh, some people only have one family farm that they're allowed to hunt and they, their goal is to shoot the most mature, the biggest deer they can on that property you're in a place and time in your life right now where you want to, you and I are kind of in the same boat. You know, Don's got his goals that I think he's going to talk about as we move on, but you and I are in the same boat and you, we have to kind of spread our wings a little bit more beyond, you know, your projects at your home farm, my projects at my home farm. Um, but I think we're both okay at this point in our career that if it doesn't happen and we have to wait till next year to give it another shot, we're just going to enjoy it the same. I had a guy on social media this week that kind of gave me a hard time because I've got a buck that's eight or nine years old and he'd probably 125 maybe. <laughs> and he yeah. kind of gave me a hard time about, well, that's the deer you need to be chasing. Well, I'll take the 170 inch <laughs> deer that's three or four <laughs> years younger any day of the week. <laughs> Don, what's it like to sit back and see the prodigy, how much he's grown over the last four years? I mean, the way he's just handling himself and talking right now, he's He's come a long way, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. And, you know, I was just sitting there thinking as Wes was talking that this guy is going to kill a bunch of giants before he wraps up his hunting career. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of young guys, Wes's age or about thereabouts that are just ate up with deer hunting. And, uh, you know, you need to be buddies with Wes because Wes has got it figured out. He, he's just putting the pieces together. The only thing he lacks is the experience. The only difference between Wes and I is, is about uh, 30 some years experience in the deer woods. And, um, you know, he's a guy that, that I would trust to hang my stand. Um, if I just got permission for a property and for whatever reason, I wasn't able to go out and scout and hang my own stand and Wes did it for me, I, I would totally trust where he put my stand. And, uh, I, I can't say that about very many people at all, but, uh, I, I see a bright future for, for him. Well, I think that, um, you know, as he's venturing out a lot of the Wes, all those properties that you said now, obviously, um, your home farm is a continuous evolution of, of projects out of all those other properties that you mentioned on there, uh, percentage of them being the first year you've ran cameras there. Um, most of them most of them are first year that you've been able to run cameras right okay. well so I, something that don mentioned earlier is something that's a page right out of his book that is very unique um so when i bought this farm something that i wanted to do is every single direction from this property within a couple miles i've at least got permission to hang a trail camera and there's so few people that do that one thing <laughs> And so anything that ends up on here, it's going to, I'm going to have a picture of it somewhere else. Right. I think that's, you know, we get a lot of questions all the time. What's your strategy for, uh, for getting permission to hunt properties? Asking to put a trail camera on a connecting woods, a half mile away is not only a great way to see where that bachelor group's coming to or where that deer's bedding, 
but it's also for years down the road, a great way to build a relationship with that landowner and get permission. And it might be, can I come kill coyotes in, in late winter? It might be, can I only bow hunt? Um, but the little pieces are ways to work in. So well, I got, I, every I got, February, I, Madison and I make maple syrup and I yeah. have found that that has been a great way is, Hey, can I, can I tap your maple trees? And so you're on there in February looking for shed antlers <laughs> yeah. and tapping their maple trees. And then it's, Hey, can I hang a trail camera? And you're getting your foot in the door. You you heard it here, folks. Maple syrup is the <laughs> conduit to getting permission properties. But I got one more very important question that we're going to end the segment with, with Wes. But Don, do you got anything you want to say before I ask this, this final question? No, I'm just, uh, sitting here trying to think how many years do I think it will be before West shoots a 200? Uh, his property, his property actually, I think is going to end up being better than mine. Uh, for one thing, it's bigger. He's got more to work with. Um, it's every bit as isolated. He's starting out, uh, probably about the same age when I, st I started working on this farm. And, uh, I, I, just, I can just envision a lot of big bucks being shot on that Indiana farm. Well, I think that uh, if Wes finds a 200-inch deer, uh, knowing Wes the way I do, he's got a good chance of killing that deer. It's finding that 200-inch deer that's uh, that's the magic. But he, he's, a, he's a good enough outdoorsman and hunter that I think he has a great shot at getting it done as soon as he finds one or grows one. So my final question, which everyone is uh, sitting on the edge of their seat right now, uh, waiting to hear the official word. Last week, we announced that you're going to be one of the presenters out in Kansas uh, in, is it February? We actually announced the wrong date on that, I heard. Uh, we had the wrong information. But the public wants to know, tens of thousands of people right now are listening, Wes. Will you present with your shirt off for the lady folks that are in the room? I will if you will. <laughs> I'm not going to be there. <laughs> uh, you will be sorely disappointed if that's your expectations. So if you want to see West shirtless, you have to be on I-70 driving westbound around Brazil, Indiana, uh, between Indianapolis and Terre Haute. You'll be able to see that off to the north side of the interstate. If, if, if you're hoping to see West shirtless, that's the only place you're going to be able to do it. It's and, next to the sign where Terry's a ballet dancer. <laughs> it's right next to that one. Well, Wes, as always, thank you for your help on the podcast. Good luck in the hunting season. Uh, we might have other segments later on in the year where we bring in the consultants of the Dream Team to get updates about what they're seeing, possibly uh, spin off a little bit of rut report stuff. We don't know. We'll see how people like this, but... Um, we appreciate your help, your friendship, and most of all, uh, you, you don't understand how even a good Christian example you are to even Don and I at such a young age. It means a lot for us. Iron sharpens iron. Thankful for you guys. All right, buddy. See you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Wes. It's like, it's like two older brothers or, uh, uh, or uh, uncles teasing him all the time, but he's starting to yeah. dish it back out a little bit. Well, you know, the whole love swing thing, it, it all started with Wes, and everybody <laughs> thinks you and I have an issue with tree saddles. We don't care whatsoever what people use. If they want to use a tree saddle, go for it. But it all started with you and me joking around with Wes, and, uh, and people got offended. But <laughs> he, was, uh, he was feeling spunky, thinking that he was going to bounce around to a bunch of properties, in it. and uh, I think the conversation, if I remember right, you said that if you got a real good lightweight Novix tree stand with, with some climbing sticks that you could be up and, and just as mobile and more comfortable. And he, he kept saying, Nope, I'm going to do it this way. And he said, okay, well, I think you called it a love swing at that point. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, we started poking fun out of him and it kind of got blown out of proportion, but we'll still ride it out. We think it's funny when people reference it on the, on the uh, podcast and tag us about the love swings, but if people are comfortable in those things, have at it. We don't care. All right, well, let's get to the first question of the night. I'll share my screen here. I'm glad that you are in a, uh, a better condition that you can read them. I didn't enjoy that last week. No, I've got a sore throat, Terry. Can you go ahead and read this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first one comes from John 
Moraski from Campbellsport, Wisconsin. Um, John says, hello, Don and Terry. My question is regarding the balance between human intrusion and food plot maintenance on a small property. I only have 30 acres, 15 of which is ag. I have four and a half acres of second year switchgrass in the middle and about three acres of food plots on the outsides. I feel like I'm always there doing some kind of work, clipping clover, planting, fertilizing, etc. I can't help but think that this is hurting my chances, but also feel that quality food plots are important. I try to never go into the switchgrass unless it's to address weeds. I would love to hear your thoughts on how to balance human intrusion and get the necessary work done to be successful. Thank you and God bless, John. Uh, well, John, that's a great question. And uh, it's one that I've answered several times, most of the time one-on-one -on -one when I'm talking to somebody, but uh, you know, the, the human intrusion factor is most important in the bedding cover. Um, if, if you're on a tractor, ATV, side-by-side, -side, whatever it is, working food plots, the deer hear that, that, that's a sound that they're used to. They live in close proximity to people, but it, it's those safe zones where those deer are bedding where human intrusion becomes the issue. Now that doesn't mean that you need to run out to your food plot twice a week just to see if the beans have put on another set of leaves or something like that. Um, you want to you want to do whatever it takes to have the best food plot you can without going in extra times. But it, it's really that intrusion in the bedding cover that's what's important. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I I draw a comparison to. If you're going out to mow your clover, you don't have to do that, but maybe two, maybe three times a year um, to keep your weeds suppressed. You know, uh, the farmers that are baling alfalfa on my farm are there every 27 to 28, 29 days, depending on the weather. Uh, filling feeders or mineral, you go back. Um, I think there's a big difference in uh, doing more routine agriculture type work than walking around or driving four-wheeler pass through the woods you know and that kind of stuff but i think you're right i think getting in on top of deer where they're bedded and blowing them out is the worst thing ever mm -hmm. it's almost it's almost like the deer pattern you before you even have to worry about patterning them yeah when you're on a piece of equipment they they know exactly where you are at all times just by listening so um, they're, they're fine with just laying tight. I mean, I can't tell you how many times on a tractor or a four-wheeler I've drove within 10 yards of deer that were either bedded or just standing there watching me go by. And as long as you keep going about your business, it doesn't spook them. But as soon as you stop and make eye contact, boom, they're out of there. So uh, just go about your business. But, uh, you know, don't make extra trips, but definitely do what you need to do. Uh, about three weeks ago, we mentioned on the podcast, maybe it was longer than that, might have been in July, uh, that I was going to do the final bush hog mowing of my property that 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 weekend. And it was at one o'clock in the afternoon and I'm bush hogging, going around the property and a doe, big old fat doe comes out and starts feeding the, at the corner, inside corner of the soybeans. And I would literally drive the tractor within... I don't know, 40 yards of her every time I made a lap with a seven foot bush hog and mm -hmm. she'd just raise her head up and watch me go by. If I would have stopped that tractor or been on foot or doing anything else, she would have split out of there. Now I know a, a mature buck's going to be a little bit more, uh, um, a little different than that, but just, uh, I think you can get by with true, um, true work on the property. Just don't overdo it. And stay out of the bedding cover and stay out of the bedding. So um, you, you walk through your, when you really look at it, you walk through your switch grass every third year to put once every three years when you burn it, that's the only time that you're inside of it. Yep. So. Hey, Spinks from Quiet Cat here in our virtual showroom space where you can connect with a product expert and learn all about our bikes, our accessories, and what makes Quiet Cat the leader in off-road electric bikes. Schedule a live session today by clicking in the link below or going to quietcat.com slash meet.
All right, well, let's move on to question number two. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Hang on. Should have it now. Okay, this one comes from Easton Gruber from Mosinee. I hope I said that right. Wisconsin. Uh, he says, hi, Don and Terry. You mentioned many times you would rather set up fewer but larger feeding areas rather than many small food plots scattered in different areas. I'm looking ahead to prep areas for frost seeding switchgrass this upcoming spring. So my question is about screening these feeding areas. In the debate with Tony, he mentioned how he took his feeding area and divided it into 13 micro plots with lines of switchgrass in order to keep bucks on his property longer with the idea that it keeps the bucks on his property longer in daylight because they have to visit each different plot searching for does instead of being able to look across a single large open food plot. What are your thoughts on this? Do you just screen the edges of feeding areas or would you have lines of switchgrass separating your clover, deadly dozen, soybeans, and corn? Uh, well, Easton, uh, another great question. Um, first of all, if I was going to break up a plot the, the way you described, the way Tony does, I would not be using switchgrass. I would be using miscanthus. And the reason for it is you can get much better screening with that miscanthus in, in a narrower strip. Uh, the switchgrass is going to require a wider strip. Uh, that miscanthus is going to do the same job in a narrower strip. It's going to be taller than the, the switchgrass. It's just going to do a better job. Also, the deer will walk right through the switchgrass where with the miscanthus, unless they've got a hole in it, they would just as soon come out around the end of it. So you can actually do some funneling with that miscanthus too as well. Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, how well that works, I, I totally understand uh, Tony's approach. Um, I, I'm not sure I'd buy it 100%. I, I, and, and the reason is this, when, when deer come out to feed, they would much rather feed in a larger plot than a smaller plot. Now, that doesn't mean they won't hit a smaller plot, but they're not going to spend much time there. They'll come and feed in it for a shorter period of time, and then they're going to move on. If you notice in the evenings, or at least from what I've seen over the years, is the big ag fields become the destination for these deer. They will hit the food plots, you know, first, and then they move on to the bigger ag fields. Well, if you've got enough acreage where you can create bigger food plot, um, I, I think that's uh, more attractive to the deer because the deer doesn't like just to come out and just stand in one spot and start feeding. He comes out and he, he moves. Right. As, as a prey species, you know, he's always on the move. Um, you know, it's just nature's way of protecting them from predators. So that buck comes out and if, if he comes out into a half acre plot, well, how long is it going to take him to move across that half acre plot? Not very long at all. Now, if he comes out into a 10 acre plot, well, it's going to take him a whole lot longer to feed across there. He's going to spend more time in it. Um, the idea that these bucks are searching for does and they, they just step out to the edge and they look out there and then they move on. I, I just don't see, I haven't seen that much of it in all my years of hunting. I, I just don't see bucks walking out to the edge of a plot looking and then turning around and, and going away. I'm not saying it never happens. I'm just saying, I think it's kind of been blown out of proportion. Um, you know, I'm kind of all on the fence of, about breaking up your plots uh, for those reasons. I'm not going to bash the the idea. Uh, maybe it has some merit, but uh, I'm probably not going to rush out to do it. And then I think that the really big thing is how does your property lay out? Do you have just like one giant rectangle plot and that's all you've got? on your farm well in that case yeah maybe maybe there is some merit to breaking it up some but if nothing else for not. if nothing else for access you might need you might need to break it up just so you can get in and out um i think the the danger there is um i guess where i just question it from a from a simple logic standpoint is is i get it maybe for the visual aspect where a deer has to go check it but a deer's nose is going to scent check that whole area 
whether there's a screen of switchgrass or miscanthus, the wind's still going to blow through it. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, from a visual standpoint, I get it. But if you're hunting the wrong wind on the wrong area of that, you're you're gonna you're gonna do more damage than anything. I think it's just a uh, it's a lot of work too. I don't know that I have necessarily time to devise all of that up. I would rather keep big funnels. I mentioned it early in the podcast. I have an area on my property that's grown up cattle pasture that I call it hillbilly switchgrass or redneck switchgrass. It's just old thorny grown up cattle pasture where I can take and and mow a strip out of my corn and bring those deer right through also so everybody's got a strategy though i don't i don't think that it's full or um i i i see the merit in it before rather than you know a, a doe factory you know i think i think that the idea doesn't hurt you by any means it's just whether it's worth it i think is the question yeah if you've got a 10 acre food plot how long is it going to take you to work and plant that food plot if it's one big 10 acre plot versus if it's screened in into 10 one acre plots well it's going to take you three times longer to work around each one of them screens and to you know when you're spraying you're going to have to you know watch the wind a whole lot closer because you're going to be um wanting to keep the herbicide off of that screening cover yeah i just see a lot of challenges i mean it's a lot more work no doubt about it yeah and and works okay if there's a return on it so i think that for you and me and our strategy and what what's talked about with clients is put that work and effort into other aspects of our plan and be in the right spot and and i think it will increase your chances just as much as this it's just i don't know i I don't want to sound negative towards tony at all but um yeah everybody everybody tends to make it a little bit more complicated than what it is and that's that's pretty much the goal of the master class isn't it right um for lester's feet this this week i want to i want to do something a little bit different uh we had a we had a very busy week um a lot of money went out i think we uh we paid out almost fifty fifty five thousand dollars to families that was donated by our donors uh but i want to i want to be selfish this week and ask for prayers for uh, a japanese family that works for us with my day job um, Lester's feet's not helping them, but, um, this young gentleman about a week and a half ago was pulled off of a job down in Alabama and the doctors couldn't find out what was wrong. He was having stomach pains and late this week, um, he was diagnosed with a very rapid stomach cancer and, uh, he's sick enough that we don't even think we can get him back to Japan. So he's got, a, I think a four-year-old kid and a newborn, and a wife over here with him so we're trying to navigate that on whether um, we can get him healthy enough to fly him back to japan uh, but um it's he's in bad shape uh, i think he's 34 years old so just devastating news not only for him and his family but my work uh so i, I ask for our listeners to keep um this young japanese guy and his family in your prayers and also um, it's nice to work for a big company that still operates like a small business and, um, you know, money's not the issue with, with our employees and we're going to do whatever that we can for this young man. So ask for prayers for that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do is we don't talk about it a whole lot, but Don, you're able to sell the Genesis drill, uh, as a dealer. So with supply chain issues and stuff, they were having trouble getting those the end of last year. If you're wanting those for frost seed, you need to go ahead and get with Don now uh, so he can make arrangements to get that. But Wildlife Farming actually produced a really cool video that, um, you know, they didn't ask us to share it, but we we got a copy of this. I'm going to put it in right now uh, for the folks watching on YouTube. And uh, I think that the people listening on the audio podcast will get a benefit out of it also. But they are one of the sponsors of the podcast. But, you know, this is this is our way of uh, selling the Genesis drill through Higgins Outdoors. So uh, listen to the spot here that we're going to play right now from uh, from these guys. And if you're interested in a Genesis drill, uh, make sure you get with Don as soon as possible so we can make sure that these things through supply chain issues are available before frost seeding time. Wildlife Farming is the leading e-commerce platform specializing in habitat management equipment. Our mission is to make available the equipment necessary for the development of wildlife habitat and improve conservation for hunting and recreational property. We carry flagship brands like the Genesis Drill and Goliath Roller, 
as well as the premier brands in planting, mowing, spraying, forestry management, and fencing equipment. Food plot and habitat goals vary. Wildlife Farming is the company that can deliver the equipment to achieve these goals. Equipment is our specialty. Our staff is trained and familiar with all the tractor and skid steer brands to make sure you get the right piece of equipment to get the job done right the first time. At Wildlife Farming, we only sell quality equipment and we have the support and expertise you need. Please visit wildlifefarming.com for all of your equipment needs. All right, Dom, we're back for question number three. You should have it on your screen right now. Yeah, this one comes from Tyler Thompson from Deer Creek, Illinois. He says, hey, Don, I've heard the term same time, same place many times and believe this is true. I see it throughout the month of November with returning bucks. However, do you apply this throughout the entire hunting season or certain phases of the hunting season? Thank you for taking time to read this. God, God bless and let's go, Brandon. Um, Tyler, th this applies throughout the entire season. In fact, you mentioned the month of November. The month of November is actually kind of the wild card. Um, you know, there's no telling when a mature buck is going to hook up with a hot doe. And when he does, um, all bets are off. So uh, I, I know that in November it can work. Uh, a lot of times it does. When those bucks start searching uh, for does, they – they don't really expand their range, but what they do is they start covering their entire range. Um, you know, I think a lot of people misunderstand. They think they've got new bucks showing up. Well, new bucks aren't showing up. Research has shown that, that these bucks don't leave their home range, even with extensive hunting pressure. Um, what they'll do is they'll find pockets within their range where there's less pressure, and that's where they spend their time. And it's the same way with these bucks during the rut. Uh, they're, they're just expanding their their travels to include their entire range and they're going to show up in places where maybe they haven't been for a while and a lot of times this it's the same time same place but um this concept really follows throughout the entire year now we're just getting ready to uh, head into that time of the year when the bucks are going to start shedding velvet and the bachelor groups are going to break up a uh, perfect example of this is uh, when those bucks leave the bachelor group, you, you can, uh, individual bucks, you can mark it on the calendar year after year. If some bucks will leave immediately. As soon as they're shedding velvet, boom, they're gone. They leave that group. Others are, are still hanging around that group into October. And whatever a buck does, it pretty much follows year to year that he's going to do the same thing. The same thing, uh, um, you know, late season, um, you get a property like mine where there's plenty of food every winter. Um, new bucks show up here more after the rut in the late season than any other time of the year. And uh, most of the time they're showing up the same week every year. So some of them are going to show up that first week of December as soon as the rut winds down. Others are going to be closer to Christmas or New Year's before they show up. So, uh, you know, that, that same time, same place thing, it, it does follow throughout the year, not just November. Yep. Great question. Great answer. Uh, before we uh, go to our last question of the night, uh, Don Bailey from BioFarm is on for the BioFarm segment. Um, a one of the things that I think a lot of our listeners have said, is they like listening to the farm side of it, the real estate side, whether they're in the market or not, it's just interesting for them. But a lot of times the product, the, the properties that are featured are these multi-million dollar properties, you know, huge acreages, uh, Don wanted to put a smaller property that had some potential for someone who wanted a little bit smaller piece of property. So we'll switch right now over to the buy farm segment with uh, one of the owners, Don Bailey. Buyafarm.com is your source for farm, recreational properties, rural homes, and more. Now here is Don Higgins with this week's featured property. Well, hey, everyone, this is Terry Peer with the Chasing Giants podcast for our biofarm.com segment. I'm here with Don Bailey again this week. And, Don, I believe you have another auction to talk about this week. Uh, yes. I have uh, 16 acres uh, near Bell Riot, Illinois, uh, bidding in September the 3rd. Uh, it's on our website. For someone looking for a smaller track of land, Terry, uh, 
it it really looks like it'd be a good track. Okay. Uh, it borders it borders some uh, state property, and it's got some interest in, or actually owns part of uh, a lake, gotcha. uh, a deep lake. Gotcha. So uh, if somebody's I, if somebody's trying to find this on the biofarm uh, website, one of my favorite ways to search for properties is by county. So what county is this property in? Uh, Jefferson County. Jefferson Illinois. County. Yeah, you know, one of the things we hear a lot is is people love the biofarm segment because they find real estate interesting and they like looking at farms and properties. But, you know, some of the farms we feature are really big or they're down on a river or something like that. Like you said, this might be uh, the property that someone's looking for that's just a little bit smaller at a lower price point. Yes, it uh, has been hunted in the past, Terry. It has some established food plots, has some bedding area. Uh, has some pines, some thick pines, uh, yada yada, it, it, and it joins some tillable fields. So, you know, for the track, it it's got a lot to offer. It truly does. Well, there's a couple key things that you said. You said it backs up against some state land. It backs up against some water. So those two things right there, uh, at least on those sides, uh, help keep your neighbors from being able to set the property line. And when you're bordered up to b- against bigger ag fields, that makes the property actually hunt a lot bigger than the acreage that is actually in the track. Yes, and it on the other side, <clears throat> it's, it's a triangle piece. And on the third side, it's a railroad track and a highway. So yep. you you more or less got the privacy of, of anything, you know, anybody. Yep. Coming one of, in on you. One of the things these hunters hate to happen is they have a picture of a deer that they've passed for years and years and years, and then the neighbors end up shooting them because they're sitting on the property line. This property gives you the advantage in small acreage to not only have access, but also protection from those neighbors. So uh, might be something that uh, people want to look into, but like you said, The auction is up on September 3rd, so they have to move fast by going to the Buy a Farm website and checking it out. Yep. Uh, And, Terry, uh, it's not to do with uh, properties, but I want to throw a yell out there to uh, the DeCoin State Fair, which is going on now. Okay. uh, Down at DeCoin, Illinois. Uh, We we call it the the Rural People's uh, Fair. A lot of people don't know anything other than the, you know, the Springfield State Fair, but uh, uh, this one is actually a state fair and it's in DeCoin, Illinois. And it, I'm not taking anything away from the Springfield Fair, but uh, this this is more, I'm going to say, country person orientated. Uh, it has, for instance, it has the Southern Illinois hunting and fishing days uh, for the kids, uh, uh, and, and a lot of activities like that. We uh, buy a farm has sponsored the 4-H uh, group here, or not here, but the 4-H people that show up to show livestock mm-hmm. uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, we give out around 3,000 T-shirts, and then we supply prize money to the uh, some of the winning uh, champions. Uh, and it's 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 it really is. If you, kind of bored or, or got a free moment to run down here uh it, it really is great uh, and as i said it, it to us it's it's more of a, a country fair they have live entertainment they have uh, car races they have uh, horse races um and pretty pretty neat deal so i don't know when you say rural we in kentucky say the redneck fair but i don't know that you want to go that far up there in illinois no, no, we, uh, uh, I, I'd have to say, uh, I'm a redneck myself because I, I live that life. <laughs> well, I appreciate the work and 4-H is just such a special program for our youth that, that not only learn about animals, but agriculture, gardening, uh, homemaking, all different kinds of activities. It's really big in my community and I commend the folks at Buy a Farm for supporting that program. Um, I think it's a worthwhile effort for the next generation. So, so Don, before we hang up, why don't you remind everybody how they can get a hold of you if they have a question about this week's featured property or anything else that's on the BioFarm uh, website. You bet. It's Don Bailey. <clears throat> My cell number is 618-919-1031. Uh, and my email address is dbailey, that's D-B-A-I-L-E-Y, at 
buyafarm.com. All right, and go check out buyafarm.com, their social media uh, um, um, social media platforms. And also, if you're in the area, go down and check out the Royal Rural People's uh, State Fair <laughs> down in Illinois. So thanks for that tip, and uh, I'll actually put a screenshot of some information about that fair up on the screen for those watching on YouTube. Pleasure to have you on, Sounds and great. thank you for the support of the podcast, Don. We appreciate you. Appreciate you guys, Jerry. Have a good day. All right, Don, to wrap up the episode for tonight, let's uh, switch gears and go to question number four. Okay, this one comes from Brad Hemmeyer. I hope I said your name right, Brad, from Gilliam, Missouri. He says, hello, Don and Terry. Love the podcast. I look forward to a new episode every week. With NutriCrave corn being a major part of your food plot program, I was wondering how you were using it in food plot design and hunting setups. Do you have your NutriCrave strategically planted around certain stands to potentially funnel deer around the edges? Would you design a NutriCrave food plot with the placement of a blind inside the corn rows? Will you be mowing a certain percentage of the food plot before hunting season starts? Will you continue to mow as needed during the season? Thanks so much for the show. Good luck this upcoming season. Um, well, Brad, I've got a series of plots in a, basically in one area on my farm, and I just rotate those those plots. So, you know, there's no design uh, specifically with my corn or anything else. Um, it's just it's on a crop rotation, very similar to what a farmer would do, just on a much smaller scale. Um, as, as far as putting a blind in the corn, I, I would. Uh, not suggest that because of playing the wind if you're out in the middle of that cornfield what wind direction are you going to hunt those deer could be come from any direction and, and most likely a mature buck is going to be on the downwind side so i i would not design anything with a blind in the middle of it um you asked about mowing a, the plot well uh this year i had some wind damage in my NutriCrave plot and, and specifically the wind didn't bother the NutriCrave as much as it did the test corn that's in the same plot. So I've got a four row corn planter. And when I planted this spring, I, I would put, uh, I had two boxes in NutriCrave and two boxes in a test corn. Well, the test corn didn't stand up to the wind too well. And I mean, it looks like an absolute jungle through that corn. And it's got some great ears on it. Even the stalks that are leaning over really bad, they still are producing some good ears. Uh, it, it's been like that for about a month. That storm happened actually when I was on vacation in South Carolina um, the first week of August. But uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to mow like the outer 20 feet of, of that corn plot. And it's a big U-shaped plot um, but with switchgrass in the middle of that U. But I'm going to mow about 20 feet on the outer edge, um, probably about the time season starts when that corn's fully mature. And then I will go back in in the winter after season's over when the ground is froze. Um, it just depends on snowfall too. Um, then I'll, I'll mow the rest of it. And the reason I like to mow it in the winter is I want to come in in the spring and no-till my soybeans into that. Um, but by getting that mowed down, uh, you know, that uh, uh, corn plant material, uh, the stalks and, and such will have a chance to kind of mat down to the ground at the spring range and, Maybe some snow on it will we'll kind of mat it down. That makes a uh, really good seed bed because those stalks will kind of help hold the moisture in. I take that Genesis drill across those corn stalks and no-till of soybeans into it and uh, don't have to work the ground at all. So it works fantastic. You just have to make sure those stalks get mowed at some point. And I like to do it late in the, well, right after hunting season, sometime in the winter when the ground is froze. Yeah, I think uh, what you've been able to do on your property, people just that don't attend the master class can't appreciate is how you have your bedding funneled into your food and be able to hunt that transition. Um, you know what? I think the list, the, the person who submitted the question is, is using your food to manipulate once they're already out of bedding. You know, you've spent 30 years to manipulate your bedding to come out and have access to the food. And that's where you're hunting versus manipulating your food to funnel, which is similar to what I'm in. 
because I haven't had my property for 30 years and, and working to that. Um, but it's always best, I think, if we can manipulate our bedding to funnel to the food and then it just basically opens up to food. But um, there are some strategies that you can use to to funnel deer along that. Um, the reason I'm in the boat that I am this year is because we had so much corn that we needed to test. I knew going in that I was going to be terminating some of that corn, um, but Dwayne wanted to get some different samples of different areas. So I put a little bit more into corn than what I would normally do, knowing that I would terminate it for fall plots, which if if I'm doing a normal rotation, I'm not terminating that corn at all. I'm going to let it stand. Mm -hmm. Hope that makes sense for everybody. Yeah, we got to keep in mind that, again, each property is different. Um, just like the previous question on uh, screening plots and breaking up bigger plots with screening, every property is different. So um, there may be situations, I'm sure there are situations where going in and mowing um, some corn down, maybe in a V-shaped funnel right in front of a blind or something, it, it was a good idea on a bigger corn patch. So, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, different tactics we can take with m manipulating our food plots. That doesn't mean that they're any of them are bad. It's they've all got their place, but they're they're more property specific, I think, than than what people want to realize. They they want to paint everything with a broad brush. And hey, I want to use that tactic because I heard some guy talking about it on social media. Well, it might be a good fit for your property, and it may not. Right. So I think what's a good fit for every property is to create, like Wes said in his segment, where you have to increase the amount of bedding. You know, it's, it's crazy that we're a food plot seed company and we always start with bedding because you have to be able to hold deer before you can worry about managing deer or, or um, you know, managing age structure. You got to be able to hold them and you can't do that without bedding. You can, you, yeah. you food, food's going to get it, but it might only get it at the, in, in the middle of the night. Foods or bedding is the key. I say all the time to my consulting clients, if you want to kill big deer consistently, you got to hunt them on the properties where they bed. So that means we got to do whatever it takes to get them bedding on your property. Yep. So all of these other ideas and strategies become very property specific. So don't overthink it. Don't overcomplicate it. Uh, but trust me, if, if, if people can get on YouTube and social media and learn all these tactics, they can try to pick apart every little comment. These, these listeners know what we said on episode 32, and I don't remember what we said last week, but, um, if people would just focus on listening, stay out, <laughs> quit putting intrusion on your property, uh, they mm -hmm. would have a whole lot more success. Yeah. You know, I just seen on social media in the last day or so. Some guy is, uh, he was on a tractor, I believe, had forks on the front of the tractor with a big water tank. He was uh, one of those big square totes and he was filling his water tank and he was scanning around with his phone camera, you know, and he was showing his tree stand 20 yards away and that water tank was sitting right out in the wide open. He'd mowed all around and I'm thinking, you know, there's no way he's killing a mature buck there. Uh, I mean, no way. I mean, he's in there, he's been in there all summer filling his water tank. He's obviously mowed the area and he's, he's got false hope sitting up there and folks, they, we're just trying to give you some solid advice. And sometimes you got to pick and choose because every property is different. There's no tactic that we're going to throw out there. That's going to work on every single property, except for what Terry has said, stay out. Stay out of the bedding cover. That works. Yeah. Well, you look really good in your Chasing Giants hard hat provided by Mr. Todd Covey. Um, we appreciate yep. the gift. We've had a lot of gifts sent to us from, from listeners, and uh, whether it's Yeti coolers, flashlights, all different kinds of things, uh, it really means a lot that people would use their hard-earned money uh, to do something like that. Um, it, it means a lot that people appreciate this that much. But uh, – um, just very, very humbled and grateful for all those people out there. Um, but let's, let's sign off this week. Next week, we're going to leave it as a surprise, but another member of the dream team is going to be on to talk about their buck forecast and what they've seen in projects and 
might be the first window that our listeners get a chance to uh, meet uh, another member of the Dream Team. But I think more importantly, it's another data point of what they're seeing with with uh, potential bucks around the country. So looking forward to that. Yeah, and like you mentioned, Terry, these uh, consultants come from all over. Um, you know, we got Mark Luster out in Iowa. We got Bobby Worthington in East Tennessee. We got you in Kentucky. We got Wes in Indiana. We got me in Illinois. So by the time everybody throws their two cents in, we're going to cover a, a wide geographic area with these buck forecasts. Yeah, um, I apologize for me looking like those who watching on YouTube, me keep looking down, but my cell phone uh, kept blowing up with the uh, cell camera and, and my shooter was standing in the alfalfa a little bit ago. So I apologize for the distraction. <laughs> um, you better show us a picture. Nah, that's, I don't think so. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully uh, next recording a podcast, I'll be sitting behind him since uh, next Saturday opens up. So. Oh, hope yeah, I have I forgot. You're close. You're close to sitting in a tree. Yeah, n- n- buddy, Come it's on. six six days. I'm gonna be sitting in a tree. This is Sunday on Saturday. Mo- Saturday's opening day. So, um, yeah. if you know, that's that's the beauty of Kentucky and in, in these summer bachelor groups. They're they're very patternable. They be, usually bed in the same place, close to bedding area, and uh, I've had really good luck with them. So, um, yeah. I'm going to be sitting in a tree, so hopefully got good news for next weekend. And if not, I'm not deviating from the plan. Well, best of luck. Uh, All right. that, uh, we got a picture of you this week with a giant. All right. Sounds good. Uh, thanks for everybody uh, tuning in, and we'll see you next week at the beginning of September. God bless, everyone. Have a great week. Chasing Giants has been brought to you by Osseo Camo, Via Farm Real Estate Company, 360 Hunting Blinds, Victory Chevrolet, Real World Wildlife Products, Matthews Archery, Novix Tree Stands, Gingerich Tree Farm, WildlifeFarming.com, Quiet Cat, and Vortex Optics. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode of Chasing Giants.